Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of Alice, Mark, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we continue on in our study in the first letter of Timothy, Paul's first letter to Timothy. Um, we left off last week, we finished in verses, in the sixth chapter, in verses uh, 9 and 10. Mm-hmm. And we're going to pick up in verse 11, right after Mark asks for God's blessing on our time together in his word. Oh Lord, we just thank you that we can get together to study your word and just bless this time to see your, what's in your word and just deposit it in our life. Amen. Amen. With great understanding, I pray. Yes. Amen. All right. As I said, uh, we had finished up last week in chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And I'm going to ask Alice if you would read those verses before we go on. 9 and 10. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang. Amen to that. That's the truth. The word of God is true. Hallelujah. All right. So let me pick up and and read uh, verse 11, 1 Timothy 6, 11. So Paul writes, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, Love, perseverance, and gentleness. Flee from these things. What things? Well, from verse 9 and 10, Mm -hmm. wanting to get rich, the love of money. And you have to understand that take you have to take note of the fact that those are the things that start off. They're the principal signs of the perilous last days that Paul will write to Timothy about in his next letter in 2 Timothy chapter 3 which starts with, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, unholy, ungrateful, unholy. That's 2 Timothy 3, 2. So it starts with that. I mean, and this is this is like the key. God has got a good order. There is a, there is a reasoning to the logic of what God, how the Spirit of God inspired Paul to lay these out. Right. It starts with being a lover of self. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that leads to being a lover of money, right? If we're not going to, if we're if we're not going to get involved in those things, if we're going to flee from those things, let me tell you: do not hang out with people who are. Don't hang out with people. Don't fellowship with people. Mm-hmm. Don't be a part of people who are pursuing riches. Right. You know, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and he says, he said, "Do not be deceived. Bad company spoils good morals." First. Uh, Corinthians fifteen thirty three. A lot of people say, well, you know, you there's a difference between it says what has a believer in common with an unbeliever. We're not to fellowship with them. What has light to do with darkness? What has Christ to do with Belial? That doesn't mean that God won't give you opportunity to go to them to bring them mm-hmm. the good news, which is profitable for correction, for training in righteousness. Mm-hmm. But you have to be very very careful about not getting entangled with them, right? Bad company spoils good morals. Here's, here, think about what Proverbs 22, verses 17 to 19, this is Solomon in his wisdom, said, Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise, and apply your mind to my knowledge, for it will be pleasant if you keep them within you, that they may be ready on your lips, so that your trust may be in the Lord. I have taught you today, even you. It's about trusting in the Lord. If you're a lover of self, you're going to wind up trusting in yourself. If you're a lover of money, you're going to wind up trusting in money. That's a fact. So when when Paul says that you're going to flee, we are to flee from these things. Mm-hmm. Flee comes from the old English meaning to take flight. Right. Because you're, I mean, in danger, get, you're in danger. Get out of here. Get mm-hmm. away. I mean, if you're in a building and it starts on fire... You're not going to hang around. You're not going to hang around. You're going to flee. That's right. You're going to take flight. And when it comes to money, Paul also said in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 10, 14, he said, Therefore, my beloved, 
flee from idolatry. Mm. Well, greed is idolatry. Yes. And you, you got to flee from worshiping and serving mammon, that god of the, the world, which is riches, wealth. Right? And rather than doing that, what you have to train yourself to do, what you have to condition yourself to do, what you have to do in practice is to pursue righteousness. Pursue it. When you pursue something, you go after it. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. When you turn from the world and the things of the world, you have to turn towards God. Okay? Yes. Remember that repentance is not just about what you turn from, but what you turn to. Okay? How many people made New Year's resolutions this year? <laughs> oh, they're going to turn from the ways it... It's not enough. How many how many New Year's resolutions out last? Right. I was going to say out last January. How, how many of them make it to like July, uh, January third? Because that, that can you can have the best of intentions, but you'll not have the power of God until you turn to God. Mm -hmm. So you got to turn from that wickedness and turn to God. Okay, we're to pursue godly qualities. Not to pursue, for example, happiness. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between pursuing this, these things and pursuing happiness. That's what Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, the other signers of the U.S. Constitution, the New Age thinkers who were part of the, the, the uh, Age of Enlightenment that was taking place back then in England and France. Yeah. <clears throat> That's what they would have you do. And then I hear, you know, I hear, listen, let's be honest with one another. I hear so many Christians, I've heard so many Christians say, oh, if I won the lottery, if I had all that money, oh, all the things I could do for God, oh, all the wonderful things I could do for God. Then the but, question, be, go ahead. You know, you've said this before, that if people who say that, if they're not doing it now, they certainly won't do it when they have money. Exactly. Because the question becomes, are you being faithful with what he has given you? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Jesus said, he who is faithful in the little things, very little things, is faithful also in much. Mm -hmm. If you're not faithful in the little things, what, what makes you, you think that you'll be faithful in the big things? I promise you, God doesn't think that. Mm -hmm. right? And regardless of what you have, because God has gifted every Christian. Mm -hmm. all right? Every one of us has a gift from God. Go read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Don't, don't, know, don't just read it. Study it. Prayerfully. Consider it. Consider it. We're not to be stagnant waters, okay? We're not to be stagnant. You ever see stagnant waters? Yes. I mean, you know, Mark lived in Central America with us. You go through the jungle. You come up, water is important. I'll tell you what, in many of the places we've been, yeah. water is life. And where you see good, fresh water, mm -hmm. that's exciting. But if you come upon a scummy, green, stagnant pool of water, that's not exciting, all right? So we're not to be those stagnant waters where, you know, uh, we're, what flows into it stops. Whatever goes into that stops. That's why it gets stagnant, because it just sits there without movement. But the living water that God has poured into us must flow out to touch the lives of others. That's our responsibility. Think about this from the prophet Zephaniah. I'm going to read from Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 12. It will come about at that time, and he's speaking of the last days, right? Yes. That I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good or evil. Because, you know what? When you don't believe that God is active in your life and active in the world that we are in, then you're going to not do anything. You don't believe God's going to do anything. You become stagnant. Nothing happens. I, I've done a lot, and I've done a lot of teaching on this, and you think about it, and if you turn your Bible, open your Bible to the book of maps, you may see this. Yes. The lifeblood, I mean, the water in Israel is the River Jordan, mm -hmm. flowing from the north down, right? It flows into Israel. It flows into the Sea of Galilee. It flows out of the Sea of Galilee and continues south. Galilee where Jesus and the disciples spent so much time teeming with life. That's why the fishermen were all there, right? Mm -hmm. But then it gets down to the Dead Sea and it stops. 
What goes into the Dead Sea doesn't flow out. Maybe that's why they call it dead. Yes. Salt there. Okay. So in your life, I mean, and be honest. It says when a man examine himself. Be honest with yourself. Are things flowing into you and then through you and out to touch the lives of others? Mm. Or are they stopping in you? Because if they are, you're going to become stagnant. And you'll become as appealing to God as stagnant water is to us. Okay. When a believer is being faithful, hearing from the Lord and being obedient to what the Lord speaks. Here's what Moses said. He said, all the blessings of God will pursue you. You know, we don't have to think about this list. Pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue perseverance, pursue gentleness. Why is it that I turn on half the, the preachers that I see on television? All they're talking about is how you can get more money by sending them money. Are we supposed to pursue riches? No. Are we supposed to pursue money? No. Absolutely, positively not. Are we supposed to pursue the blessings of God? This is what I'm going to tell you. No. This is the list of what you're supposed to pursue. But I promise you. That's, this is prosperity. I'll tell you what, because this is prosperity, and here's God's promise to you. Mm -hmm. It's in Deuteronomy 28. Yes. That when you hear the voice of God, when you obey the voice of God, then he is going to bless you. Well, let me, just the, yeah. the blessings of God, they're going to come upon you. The blessings of God will overtake you. The blessings of God will pursue you if you're being faithful to God. Are these, this, I've seen these words before. They're the fruit of the Spirit also. A lot of them. Well, yeah, some of them. I mean, faith and love and perseverance, yes, gentleness. Yeah, but that's the gift of the Holy Spirit at work in us. And that should be our great desire, you know, is to have the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But again, even like with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruit is more important. I so, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the fruit. That's right. what I'm talking about. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, again, it's something that is supposed to flow through us. Right. Okay? And that's what he said. You'll know them by their fruit. By their fruit, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But if you want the blessings of God, seek God. Seek his righteousness. Did you never hear? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the rest will be added unto you. God watches over his word to perform it. He means what he says. You know, there's a verse that I, the way I hear it used more often than not, it really troubles me. And that is in the third letter of John. Now, I'm going to read this to you. Mm -hmm. 3 John chapter yes. 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. I'll read it. Okay. The elder, this is John, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth. That is how you're walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in truth. Mm. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they're strangers. And they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. Gaius had a reputation throughout the church for his giving. Right. For the ministry of giving. Mm. He did. That, and that is a ministry. Check yes. Romans 12. Yes, it is. But the point is, he didn't have to pursue it. No. And I hear this verse quoted all the time. God wants you rich. You know, listen, this is written to Gaius, who God knew to be somebody that what went into him flowed out to him to bless the church. Most of the people, most of the time it's being preached, it's about so it can come into you and it's all yours. Yeah, this is not, that's it's not a verse that you can speak into somebody's life. No, it's that's, not. It's got to come from God. Yeah, I, I don't want to get sidetracked myself as I normally do, mm -hmm. but I do want to say this. Whatever was written in earlier time, all scriptures, yes. all right, was written for our instruction. Every scripture is written for us. Yes. Not every scripture is written to us. There are a lot of verses in there you wouldn't want God to say to you. No, no, no. So you can't, just because God said this to Gaius, don't think he's going to automatically say it to you. Test yourself, examine yourself, and see. Do you have that same heart? I mean, that when God gives you something, that it flows right out to bless the church, to bless others. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. 
And then from there, I mean, you know, it yeah. radiates. Right. Starts in the household, your household, starts in the household of God, and then it'll flow out. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to 12 and 13. This is chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. Fight the good fight of faith. You know that it's a battle? Yes. It's a daily battle. <laughs> Christianity is about mm -hmm. living, living our faith mm -hmm. is warfare. Yes. Now, our warfare is not against flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. And the weapons are our warfare are divinely powerful, not those of the world. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's a war. It's a battle. Think about what Paul wrote to the Galatians. This is Galatians 5, 16 and 17. But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. The flesh and the spirit are at war, constant war. And let me tell you, it's a battle to the death. Yes. And then he goes on, right? And he says, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Romans 7, 22 and 23. It's a battle. It's warfare. And as I say, it's a battle to the death. Think about it. He said, I charge, I charge you in the presence of God. This is serious stuff. Yes. It's serious. What Paul is saying is not to be taken lightly. Because remember, this is not just Paul saying it. It's God speaking to us mm -hmm. through Paul. It is not an expression that he would use outside of the most serious situations. I mean, that's not something common to Paul. I charge you in the presence of God. But he did again in his next letter to Timothy. And he said, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Second Timothy 4, 1 and 2. I, char I solemnly charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus. Serious, what? very serious. Preach the word. Does it go back to that good confession? In season and out of season? Mm -hmm. Not just when you feel like it, okay? How do you know what, you know I can't find a specific in here that says, okay, Paul says to Timothy, you said this, and that's a good confession. No. But he says you made the good confession. So how do you know what the good confession is? Because it says it in the next verse. Mm -hmm. Or not, before Pontius Pilate. Right. Jesus made the good confession before Pontius Pilate. So I'm going to read John 19, 10 and 11. Think about this. This is the good confession. So Pilate said to him, to Jesus, you do not speak to me. You do not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you. Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. John 19, 10 and 11. You know what the good confession was? My father's in charge. My father is in control. Now, I'm going to tell you, Pontius Pilate thought for sure that Caesar back in Rome was in control. Jesus didn't believe that for a minute. All authority flows from the top down. And the authority that Pilate had was given him by God the Father mm -hmm. to accomplish God the Father's purpose. It pleased him to crush Jesus Christ to put him on that cross for our transgressions. God, my father, is in control, and I am his. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. His banner over me is And love. his banner over me is love. That comes from a, a, a book that you don't hear an awful lot from because it's all about love, <laughs> real love, yes. right? The Song of Solomon. Yes. That was from, from chapter... 2 verse 4 and chapter 6 verse 3. That's a love song. Yes. 
But the point is, you can trust God because he loves you. Amen. That's, I, it, it pains me to see how few people even want to even touch, go near the Song of Solomon because it's too, maybe it's too erotic. Mm. No, it's too loving. It's all about love. And it's expressed in human terms. Well, that's because God loves humans. Oh, there. It's all about, you know, Christianity is nothing but a love story. Yes, it is. That's right. Christianity is not all about, it's not about padded pews, big buildings, pipe organs. Christianity is a love affair with Jesus Christ. Yes. It's a love story. The greatest love story ever told. The greatest love story ever told. But think about this, because the church at Ephesus, one of the most powerful churches in the New Testament. I mean, they they had such an effect. Why did Jesus have to write to them through John on the island of Patmos and say to them, but I have this against you, that you have love less le left your first love. Revelation 2.4, you've left your first love. You know, love is like anything else. It needs to be cultivated. It needs to be nurtured. It needs to be fed. It needs to continually grow. I, a lot of people, I, I just have to say this. I mean, Alice and I have been married for over 50 years and eight months. I, I can say in all honesty that I love her today more than I did back then. Now, it may, it may feel different in some ways, but our love has grown because we've nurtured it. I mean, 50 years, eight months. Every month for 50 years and eight months, we've celebrated our anniversary every, on, on the month. We, we work at having that. I mean, we feed that. We nurture it. We cultivate it. God put man on earth to cultivate, right? Got to work at it. So I'm telling you, I'm telling you, husband, loving your wife is not, it's something you need to do. That's right. It's something you need to do. It's something you need to, you need to cherish her. You need to love her. You need to cultivate that, that love that you have for her. And wives, the same thing is true for you back to your husband. Amen. It's not a 50-50 situation. No, it's 100-100. That is correct. <laughs> it, well, it is. It is. You got to put out 100 You have to give it all. You have to give all. Yeah. And, and that's the same with Jesus. And if, he as opposed to some football commentators, you don't, you can't give 110 percent. God doesn't expect 110 percent. You don't have 100. You don't have 110 percent. No. But I'm going to tell you something. He has every right to expect 100 percent. Amen. And your wife has the right to expect that you will love her with 100 percent of your being, and vice versa. That's right. All right. First 14 and 15. First Timothy 6: 14 and 15. That you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Keep the commandment. Well, a man came up to Jesus one time. And let me, let me read you what he said from Matthew 22. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Uh, if you, and Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? Amen. I surrender all is not just a great hymn of the church. It's supposed to be the great confession of a believer. No, there are a lot of great confessions. My father is in control. He's poured that love into my heart yes. through the Holy Spirit. You have to surrender all to Jesus Christ. You know, I, I probably I've mentioned this before. We were in London. I, I spent a lot of time in London. Uh, and for a couple of years in a row, I was doing a lot of ministering to this one large group in London. Uh, and there was a woman who was in charge of it. It was a they were, they were all basically West Africans, and they had started this prayer group throughout, throughout England, actually. And at the teaching one time, I met her on the street in London, and she came up to me, and just out of the blue, she said, you know, what, what's the most important thing? This is what she said to me. What's the most important thing that you've learned in all the years that you've been serving God? Well, that's really a cool question. I mean, it, I, 
it caught me and I had to stop and think for a minute, you know, what's the most important thing that I've learned? And God gave me an answer. The most important thing that I've learned is Jesus is Lord and I'm not. It's real simple. Mm -hmm. You know, get that fixed in your head. He is your Lord. We're supposed to do keep the commandment without stain or reproach. Now, I said a moment ago that we need to get away from our religiosity. We, that's what that is, right? Uh, and when I talk about religiosity, I'm talking about the relics and the rituals, the superstitions and the traditions of, of men. Traditions of men that all too often keep us from the commandments of God. Go read Mark chapter 7, right? So we need to get back to, we want religion. There's nothing wrong with religion but pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. James 1.27. It's supposed to be in the world, but not of it. It's not just about, you know, loving the world. You know, we're not supposed to love the world. No, no. And I've mentioned that a number of times here in this study. But it's also, think about what James said. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Yes. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Mm -hmm. James what for? Don't want to be an enemy of God. And, because that's a battle you can't win. No. no. I'll tell you, that's a battle you can't win. It says, woe to him who quarrels with his maker. Right. So this is what goes on until the appearing at the proper time. Boys and girls, Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, At is. the appointed time, yes. the Father's time, more and more I hear people mock and scorn. People ridicule and persecute. They hated Jesus. They crucified him. But he is, as that verse says, the sovereign, the King of kings, oh, and the Lord of lords. Yes. And it says in Philippians 2, verses 8 through 11, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue, all of the believers in heaven on earth and all of those who are under the earth, not believers, every human that has reviled him, every human that has scorned him, every human that has hated him and Satan himself will bow before Jesus and confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise God. That's the truth. So let me tell you, start now. Mm. Start proclaiming. Start confessing his greatness, his glory. And remember that our Father is in control. Satan's not in control. The world is not in control. You're not in control because you're supposed to have surrendered. And the word awesome doesn't belong to anybody but God. He is awesome. Yes. God is awesome. That's so, his word. Father, we thank you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that you did for us through your son, Christ Jesus, what we could never do for ourselves, that you restored us, you redeemed us, yes. you recalled us, you brought us back into a right relationship with you. Help us to be that people that shows forth the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness, your son, Jesus, and into this marvelous light. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord God, to take that joy that you've put into us and let it flow out and touch others that love, that peace. Help that, Lord God, to flow out and touch the people around us. Help us to make the good confession and be faithful witnesses to the power of your love in our life. We thank you, Father. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Yes. In Jesus' wonderful Amen. name. Well, until next week, come back. We love you. We pray blessings upon you. Amen. Pray for us, will you? Till next week. One for the other. God bless you until next week. Bye bye.
of your mighty love.